Great. So now is the exciting time um, to go deeper into learning about studying game design at AIT. I would love to invite on screen Anthony. Hey Donna, how you going? Hey, how you going? Very good. I'll just um, share my screen and take over. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Anthony. So I'm one of the course advisors here at AIT. Um, I'm based up in Sydney. Um, I'll bring on some of my friends as well to help me talk about games design. So first we've got Henry, who's on the chat. How are you going there, Henry? Hey, and I'm doing well. How are you, everyone? Pretty good, man. Good. Now, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. I actually wrote it in a chat as well a moment ago, but uh, if everybody who is asking questions, please change it to everyone when you're sending the questions, not just to host and panelist. That way we can all see the responses and also the questions you are actually asking. Thanks so much. Cheers, Henry. Um, we've also got Tyus on the chat too, who's our international advisor. So you can say hi and wave as well, Tyus. Hello, everyone. And then we've also got our grad, um, Jack O'Shea, who did the interactive media degree with us and majored in games design. So we'll have a chat with him a bit later as well. So are you there, Jack? Yeah, I am. How are you, mate? Good, mate. Good. How are you? Yeah, very good. Good, man. We'll, we'll chat to you in a little bit. Sounds All good. good. So we'll jump into it. So a little nice little segue with Jack. So he was doing a Bachelor of Accounting. He'll talk a bit more about that at the end. Um, realized it wasn't really for him and then decided that games was sort of the area that he wanted to focus in. So he did the interactive media degree with us, majored in games design. Um, and now he's, you know, a senior developer for a company called Red Cartel. So he's won a bunch of awards at the AEAF, which is Animation Effects Awards Festival. Um, got awards for best graphics of Five Kings. He's done a fair bit of stuff. And if you have any questions for Jack, you can chuck it in the chat now. But we'll also dive into sort of his career at the end as well. So if you look around, there are a lot of degrees that sort of just focuses on game art or just the coding aspect. And it's a little bit sort of, you know, singular in terms of the dimension it focuses on. Our degree does sort of cover everything. So you're gonna be doing the coding, the design, the graphics, the 3D modeling. It, it actually is one of the more sort of comprehensive games courses that you can do. Uh, so we're pretty proud about that because we do want students to be as multi-skilled as possible. So we, you need to sort of have confidence that whatever job you go for or whatever sort of games project is put in front of you, you're going to have those skills to be able to do it. So to sort of break down that, we start from the very traditional of tables of games and then move all the way up to the more advanced state-of-the-art AR, VR stuff as well. Um, so you basically get exposed to everything. Um, don't write off tabletop game, games too quickly. Um, we did have some students who made a really cool card game, took it down to PAX in Melbourne, which is like one of the biggest um, games sort of expos. They sold out of their card game in the first day, made a fair bit of money out of it, and then just spent the next two days just having fun, hanging out at the Doom Expo and all that sort of stuff. Um, so they had a pretty good time and made a fair bit of coin out of it. Because at the end of the day, you do have to be able to sort of monetize your game as well. So it's not just a matter of, you know what, I really like 3D games and I don't really like 2D games. Like that's fair enough if that's what you think. But when you do work for like a game studio, you're gonna be sort of asked to make a bit of everything. Um, Cause that's sort of how you make your money. You make what the customers want, you know? So it's about monetizing as well. So your game's only as good as what someone's sort of willing to pay for it in a way that, um, so the point we sort of try to make is expose yourself to as much as you can within the games area, because the more you know, um, the better off you're going to be. So just have an open mind to sort of all of it, you know. But of course, you're going to be able to specialise and focus on one area that you want to focus on more than the other anyway. Um, so with that comes our employment rate. So because we do have students who have done pretty well since finishing of us. Jack's a pretty good example of that. Um, we've got Natalia, who is going to be coming on later in the IT course as well, who did games programming. So she's working in the game space as well. So there's a fair bit of work out there in terms of games. It's just more a matter of what sort of skill you have under your hat and sort of how much effort you put into it. But 
if you expose yourself to everything within the games area, your, your chances of finding work is pretty good, particularly if you put, you know, your best foot forward. So, um, yeah, Jack's working at Red Cartel, but we've got students working at, you know, Block 42, Chaos Theory, Blowfish, Featherweight, all of the sort of um, more popular sort of game studios that you can find in Sydney and Melbourne. We've got, there's, there's, there's AIT grads in there. So you're in pretty good hands. So the way this sort of breaks down with the course is you've effectively got like three choices. So the diploma is the first year of the degree. The associate degree is year one and two, and then the bachelor is three years. So you can enroll into the bachelor. If you finish the first eight subjects, you can just stop there and graduate with a diploma if you want to. Um, other way around as well, you can enroll into the diploma, finish the first eight subjects, and then just continue on to year two and three if you want. Um, if you're in the bachelor and the dream job pops up after the, after the first two years, you know, give it a go, graduate with an associate degree, have that qualification, and then just come back and finish off the last year if you want to. Um, classes are sort of being delivered online and on campus, like a blended version. While we still battle with COVID, um, every live class is online. So we have a student software called Canvas, where you basically watch all your classes through Canvas. You download all the software that you need, has all your timetabling and everything. Um, so even when we do open campus back on, it's a bit different for international students, but you do sort of have the option for attending online or, or on campus for a particular session. Um, but this is kind of the breakdown of how that works. So in terms of subjects, there's a little bit of perseverance because we do want students to be as multi-skilled as possible. So you don't just go with games design from start to finish. Um, that's intentional because you do want to have those foundational skills behind you as well. If you decide that games is not for you and you're halfway through, you've got a, quite a strong sort of skill set to be able to do whatever in design, really. So you're not pigeonholed with us. So to kind of break down the three years, the first year is like your introduction into everything, basically. So um, we get asked a lot, you know, how much do I have to know before I start? Um, the answer really is nothing at all, because we teach you, like we'll teach you everything, basically. So that first year is getting exposed to how to conceptualise something, draw it up and design it in one way or another. Um, that's kind of exposing you to that way of thinking. Then when you get into the second year, that's when you start to specialise in games specifically. So you'll go down the game assets, game development road, and that's basically when you start building games. Um, you will make three games from scratch throughout the whole degree. So this, I know this might look like it's not that gamey, but if you break it down into what's game specific, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. So the first year you're getting exposed to a bit of everything. Second year you start to really ramp up those game development skills. And then the third year is more moving towards what's called the Forge program, which is your final game from scratch, which you then present to a games industry panel. Um, so that's kind of what Alex was talking about before, where your sort of segue into connection to industry comes in. And it's sort of the main reason why a lot of our students find work pretty quickly after sort of studying with us because of that Forge project. So I saw a question before from um, Wafa asking about games theory or just theory in general. So the way it kind of works here with, with theory in relation to games is you're getting exposed to what a game is, why a game is a game, and basically like why someone would want to play a game, what sort of lighting you need, what sort of colour you need, like is a red is a red character mean he's evil or does blue mean he's good? It's the theory of sort of how, you know, everything in a game setting works. Then you go down two avenues. So you go down the programming avenue and then you go down the game art and sort of design avenue as well. So um, but don't be too scared about games programming if you don't think you're like a coder or, or IT person, because it's really not mathematical at all. Um, we'll talk more about games programming in the IT course after this, but it's really nothing to be worried about. Um, Jack will tell you as well that it's actually pretty fun. But then you go down the sort of 3D art as well. And if you want to do more artistry stuff, then you pick more up as your electives. Then you move into your final project, which is your sixth game that you've made from scratch, and then you're presenting it to a panel. So it's pretty good. You're doing a fair bit of hands-on stuff, and you are making some pretty solid stuff. Um, this is a showreel from Unreal, the Unreal Game Engine. So that's the main engine that you'll be using to make games with. Um, pretty much every company is going to be like, how much do you know about Unreal? 
um, the Unreal 5 is about to come out. I think we're in early access to that, uh, I think around April. So chances are by the time you start, you'll be using Unreal 5 probably. Um, but right now it's the, still in the fours, but you can, gives you a pretty good idea of what you can do with Unreal Engine. And it's a lot of games you're familiar with uses Unreal as well. So basically you're adding to that pre-existing engine and making your own game through that pre-existing engine. Um, if you do games programming, which we'll talk about a bit later, you do actually make your own custom engine as well, which is a bit different, but that's obviously takes a bit more IT muscle. But um, using something like Unreal is, um, is pretty good for making a game where the graphics are already pretty solid. It's just sort of up to you on designing that sort of 3D environment yourself. Um, you'll probably see when Unreal 5 comes out that graphics and sort of the way games are made becomes a lot nicer um, or a lot more advanced. Usually the reason why games get better and better is because the engines get better and better. So even though that showreel was pretty impressive, it's, it's gonna get better as Unreal 5 comes out. Um, if you're wondering about what sort of games what sort of games jobs are out there? There's actually a fair bit. Um, this is These ones here are more game specific, but keep in mind when I mentioned that you've got that foundational year in the first year, which, which opens up a more sort of avenue of different non-game based jobs as well. But if you really want to, if you really do want to work in games, usually the first job or the entry level job is a, is a debugger. So playing games and sort of looking for bugs and trying to sort of, you know, um, work out bugs in certain levels or whatever, and then you can be sort of a QA tester or a QA analyst in fixing those bugs. Um, there's a lot more than just this list as well. You can go down like script as well. Like if you look at um, Grand Theft Auto, that's just a, a massive thick book of just storyline and, and text and scripts and that the story of what happens from the start to the finish of the game. So the people who worked on that script didn't even make anything to do visually. It was all just designing this, like the story aspect. So there is that sort of road as well. And then you can be, you can be like an environmentalist where your job is literally just making the environment in a game. It takes a real specialty to make water. Water in a game is actually really hard to 3D model. So there's some people who their main job is making water or like making rocks or making trees. Cause it is getting, as we try to make it more realistic it's taking a lot more time to build one certain thing. So that's kind of opening up more specialty or more specialized roles as well. So just keep that in mind that you can, you really can find your niche as well. It's just a matter of how much work you want to put into that particular area. Um, we do have times on campus for you to sort of showcase what you've done and sort of highlight what you've, you know, what you've done. So one of the main ways is um, our event called Games Day where you can win an award for best AR, VR game, best shoot 'em up game, best tabletop game. Um, we have an award for best cosplay and you usually receive those awards from industry as well. So it's nice to be recognized for the work you've done. It's good to be able to just put tools down for a second, play some other students' games as well, because we have like PCs around the whole campus and you can walk around and play a bunch of students' games. Even if you're not a student, um, like a current student, you can still attend this as well. It's a pretty fun day, we have pizza, have some beers and stuff and just play each other's games and see what everyone's up to and just get a bit of recognition and do some mingling with some um, some industry as well, which is pretty fun. So there's the video there. I'll, I won't play it now because I've got a, a few other things to sort of get through in terms of vids, but I'll talk about it a bit more in games programming as well and I'll, I'll play that vid there. Um, we also have an event called Games Mastermind. So this is a little bit less interac interactive but it's a lot more sort of um, advice heavy. So basically it's a games panelist. They talk about all the things that you need to know for working in the games, all the things that you don't really need to know, what sort of skill you should have, what things you should be focusing on, um, changes in the games industry, like from Unreal 4 to 5 and what that means. A company is moving from Unity to Unreal or vice versa. So it's basically giving you all the ins and outs of what it means or what it takes to sort of be a games employee, basically. But also it's another chance to sort of meet these guys as well in person, because you can never have sort of too many friends, particularly in the games um, space in Sydney and Melbourne, which is which is sort of small in a way, but um, it's not necessarily a bad thing because once you meet everyone, you've kind of got a fair bit of choice of where you, where you want to apply for and what you want to do moving forward when you finish. 
So this is an idea of some of the past panelists who have had, or we've had for um, the games sort of based projects. So, you know, you make your sixth game, you present it to Damien from Luminal or from Ellen from Blowfish. So you're not just presenting it to our, our teachers and they're like, oh yeah, cool. Like they're more your mentors through the Forge program and you're showing your game to people who you're probably going to be asking for a job for as well. So if your game's good enough, these guys do give you on the spot um, internships or interviews or employment. It just depends on how much work you put into that into that final game. But whatever happens, you've still got a bit of networking that's going on in the meantime as well. So um, it's pretty nice to meet some people in the games industry before you finish. So we do have scholarships as well. Um, if you're looking to start in February, we actually just had the deadline of the 7th of Jan, um, but there's definitely, it's definitely open now for May. So we've got a domestic scholarship and an international scholarship. Basically you're given like a brief, you tackle it the best way you can. And then the winner receives 50% um, off their first semester and 50% off their last semester as well. So to apply, all you really need to do is just put through an application form. Um, we'll send you like an online link thing to sign your offer and verify your ID and stuff. Then we'll help you sorting out your fee help or if you're an international student, we'll help you sorting out your visa. Um, so any questions in terms of applying, you can always ask me or, or Henry or Charlotte or anyone who's on here as well. Um, so if you're a domestic, you can put through an application through that top link. And if you're an international, just shoot through an email um, to international at AIT and we'll, we'll help you get started if you do want to start. Still definitely heaps of time for Feb if you do want to start in Feb. Um, so these are our numbers here. So you can always send us a text or give us a call whenever you want. Um, you know, shame we can't be on campus at the moment, but it's all good. We'll, we will be soon once sort of Omicron chills out. But um, any questions or anything, just feel free to give us a buzz or just shoot through a text. Okay, so I'll bring Jack back on. Jack, how you going there, man? Yeah, I'm good. One sec, there we go. How are you? Yeah, good, mate, good. Um, so I've got a I've got a plethora of questions today, if that's all good. Because ended the day, yeah, awesome. talk session, you know. Um, yep. we, we'd love to hear about your backstory, man. Like, what led you to pursuing a career in games and and that move from accounting in the first place? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so it was interesting. Um, I finished year twelve at school, and you sort of got all the pressures straight away to find what you want to do and get out there and jump straight to a uni degree. Um, so I was doing well in business at the time. So naturally, I thought accounting would be the go. Um, so I went, jumped into a course there, um, which I was going through for about three semesters, I believe. So about a year and a half. Um, but I found in that third semester that I was really starting to do, oh, I wanted to do something else really. I was trying to fill my time with hobbies as opposed to doing my work for accounting, which led me naturally to looking at Unity for the first time, um, mm. starting to look at a bit of software stuff, a bit of modeling. I just knew that that was sort of what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go. So I had to make the hard decision to sort of leave my degree um and then start hunting around for where i wanted to actually pursue game development um and that in itself led me to find ait um, and then started at ait in 2014 um, with a bachelor of interactive media so what are you up to now um and because i we're, you're still at red cartel but what 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 is red cartel all about what are the sort of projects that they usually work on yeah, sure. So um, primarily we work um, in the space of AR, augmented reality and virtual reality, um, but we do pretty much everything across the board. Um, so we've done everything from enterprise computer applications to those things, of course, but we do a lot of stuff um, in the animation industry as well for movies and stuff like that. So a really diverse amount of work in all sorts of avenues of the industry. So it's super mm. exciting, but yeah, we do all of that, um, I guess, in terms of the sort of things that we've done before. So we've done, we did the first virtual marketplace for eBay, um, which went into the Gear VR headset. Um, we've done some stuff for Optus, um, done some stuff for Shell, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, mm. A bunch of stuff. A lot, a lot of the big companies we've done some stuff for. Um, they usually do these things for, I might say expos and stuff like that, or it would be to push a campaign through an augmented reality app where you use that to go and look at QR codes in store and things as well. But yeah, very a lot of stuff, a very diverse amount of work. Um, can you talk us through like your personal journey there, like what we, what your initial role is and then sort of how it's progressed since then? Because you've been there for a while, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. We're coming up on about six years at this point. Um, but yeah, um, we'll go through the journey. So I was at AIT from 2014 to 2016 um, doing the degree on an accelerated course so I could get through in two years. 
um, just given that I did the accounting degree before I sort of wanted to really get out there and to start working. So I did that in two mm. years, um, went straight across into an internship, which was hooked up with AIT um, with Tamara. So um, I went straight across pretty much into an internship, which was meant to be for uh, four weeks a month. Um, I got about three weeks into that and got offered a contractor role um, just to be brought on to do some programming um, as a junior role as a contractor. Um, I would say that lasted for around a year and a half um, before I did um, get promoted up to a mid-level developer. Um, and in that time, I did about three months of uh, being a contractor before they offered me a full-time position, which is very exciting. Um, so then once I was at mid-level, um, I did that for about, I'd say two years, two and a half years before I then was promoted up into a senior developer role. Um, so I guess the difference in all of those as well was between a junior and a mid, um, you definitely have your people above you who are just telling you what to do on your day to day. So mm. I'd come in every day. I'd know what job are you on? What task do you need to complete? Uh, this is what you're doing for the next few days. And then we'll review and go over your stuff pretty much. Um, but once I was promoted up into a senior developer, um, I sort of took on that role of assigning the, ro uh, assigning the tasks out to all of our mids and juniors um, yeah. and sort of just getting jobs ready, preparing quotes, stuff like that. Um, and that pretty much took me through until about six months ago where um, Red Cartel has gone through an acquisition um, with a new parent company um, called XRG. Um, XRG owns a range of indoor skydive tunnels. It's a big mixed bag. So indoor skydive tunnels, um, and they own about four of their own VR arcades that run all the VR games you could ever think of. Um, and then as well as that, we've got a military branch as well, just for military training stuff. So um, in that move, I've moved up into the lead software engineer um, for Red Cartel and XRG um, for the moment in terms of um, our work in Red Cartel, um, as well as lead of development, which just means that everything with the jobs coming in that I'm working, I'm very hands-on um, with talking to clients, getting everything organized, allocating stuff down to our seniors and stuff as well. Um, but yeah, there's all of that. It's super exciting. So with the Freak Arcades, um, we pretty much run big multiplayer um, arenas, which can have four people in backpacks and headsets all playing VR together. Um, mm -hmm. And then you also have solo pods as well, where people can just come in, they can play games together or they can just play by themselves for half an hour as well. And we've got like all the latest games and everything as well. So it's a big journey. It's about six years in total or just about six years, but it's been, it's been great, super exciting. And um, yeah, I'm very appreciative and very lucky to be where I am right now. Yeah, well, it's awesome to hear how much you've progressed in that six years, particularly when, you know, it was originally meant to be 120 hours or four weeks or whatever, and then six years yeah. later, and now you're ripping. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> but speaking of like AR and VR projects, like you've actually worked on some pretty cool stuff um, in terms of the AR and VR. But can you touch on sort of what skill sets needed to be able to make an AR and VR game? Like, what do you have to know to be able yeah, to do it? Absolutely. So I guess... Um, at an entry level, I was immediately working on VR and some AR work as soon as I came across the Red Cartel in an internship. So mm. the entry level um, is not extremely high, so it shouldn't be too daunting. Uh, but yeah. any knowledge that you do learn um, and you apply to your 2D applications like you would be doing at AIT, and there might be some VR in there already, but all of that stuff is completely transferable across to when you're doing VR. Um, the difference in doing VR is obviously that you've moved away from um, a 2D game to three-dimensional sort of stuff. So now I'm worrying about I'm picking up things, I'm interacting with buttons, I'm pulling levers, um, stuff like that. Um, yeah. And also the fact that um, everything, it's a much bigger world. It can get much closer to things as well. So from the art perspective, um, you're not so much worrying about hiding things around that corner, but people can probably and likely walk around that corner and have a look at things and pick up, um, let's, let's say that apple and look really closely at the textures and materials and stuff that are on it. So for artists, I'd say the bar sort of jumps up a little bit, but very easy to get along with for someone that's very passionate. And from a development point of view, um, I would say everything's very transferable. Um, you've got SDKs and packages that sort of do a lot of the heavy lifting to start off. Um, mm. The stuff that we're doing now with Red Cartel um, are very custom solutions and stuff that we've built in-house to sort of ease the process. But absolutely for someone that's just sort of freshly coming into VR, it shouldn't be scary because there's so many resources and things like that that people can get into that, yeah, it'll make it a lot easier for them. Yeah. So, well, speaking of AR and VR, we've got a that shell project that you mentioned really briefly before. We'll yep. play this video and we'll we'll have a chat about it. So, this is um, a project, an AR VR project that Jack um, worked on with Red Cartel. So, I'll play this and we'll come back and a bit more of a chat. No worries.
of the big challenges you have at supercar events is that it's an incredibly crowded place. There are hundreds of brands out here vying for attention. So what we needed to do was to create a unique experience that supercar fans were going to love. We've created an interactive multiplayer VR game which has a customizable social outputs for Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Ball player, uh, first time it's been done, and the people don't just look around, they're physically doing the right steps to make a car pit stop. To be perfectly frank, there's nothing like this in the pits or anywhere in the environment. No one, no, no supercar team, no supercar um, brand associated with it, it's got anywhere near to what we're doing here. I mean, our key messaging is really around performance and efficiency. This is a great property to actually bring that to life because you've got to perform, you've got to be quick and efficient. We built the entire experience inside a five metre by five metre green screen room with full surround sound and camera arrays tracking each player, rendering key moments into mixed reality videos. Players were texted a link to their personal video to share on social directly after the experience, as this is when propensity to share is at its highest. The experience was phenomenal. Like, it's just unreal. It's almost like you're right there at the track. It's unbelievable. You know, I think that's the most realistic thing outside of changing a wheel on a race car you will ever do. So good, man. I'll just stop sharing my screen in case it plays again. <laughs> That's the last. That's all right. <laughs> um, so, what was what was your designated role in that project? Sure. Um, so, this one to uh, this job took place. I would say roughly six months after I started with Red Cartel. So, at that point, I was still very much in a junior role. Um, but I was allocated into um, a portion of the multiplayer networking aspect because you got four people playing in there, um, as well as all of the mixed reality videos that you're seeing there, where um, the real people are um, composed over the top of the virtual footage. Um, we ran all of that through, like they say, we've got um, webcams up in the corner um, in a green screen room so that we can composite that and place it on the computer. Um, but that also needs to be run through Unity. Um, so we, I had to write some of the custom stuff to allow that rendering to happen to plug that out into a video so we could text message that straight away to people. So um, I did, I touched on the networking multiplayer stuff. I did, a, I'd say, a sizable portion um, of the, base code um, for the entire thing um, and then also I did all of the mixed reality stuff at that point. Awesome. Um, how did the the Bachelor of Interactive Media and, and specializing in games design sort of help you and be able to build that? Yeah sure. Um, so I'd say with that I came out there was another part of that also was um, I had to do a lot of the audio 3D and stuff so that was super helpful. I came out knowing a lot about that from my AIT course especially with the audio stuff so I put my hand up to jump straight in for that. Um, I'd say the main thing with how AIT sort of helped me with this was that um, through my teacher, Carlton, at the time, um, he always had time to help me in my spare time. I was very passionate, so I always had a lot of questions for him outside of class time and that as well. Um, but AIT and Carlton gave me the opportunity to sort of ask all those questions, really sort of pre-prepared me to jump across. Um, and once that project was coming up, I felt much more at ease and much more com comfortable amongst working with all of these, obviously, higher developers than me at the time, uh, working with them, understanding their code, getting amongst it and not being completely out of my depth. So yeah, of course, like for how soon I was doing that once I came in, I'd have to credit that to AIT um, and the help of the teachers and everything as well. So yeah. Awesome. Um, like, are there any new projects that you're working on with Red Cartel or even outside of that you're excited about? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess to go on more about the acquisition um, that happened about mm. six months ago. So right now, um, things that are out in the open to the public um, that we're working on currently is obviously this military training tool. So yeah. this is going to revolutionize the way that people do CQB training. So that stands for close quarters battle. But you just imagine someone, um, let's say in an eight by eight meter space. Um, but if they're there in real life, it's just an eight by eight meter floor made up of corridors, rooms, enemies, whatever there could be on the battlefield. Um, but this yeah. is just to pretty much train people in CQB and how they would navigate that floor in terms of angles, approaching doors, positioning, stuff like that. So we're hoping that it will be a very pivotal tool to saving lives on the battlefield. And that's what we're sort of pushing with. Um, we aim for as realistic a simulation as possible. So there's no 
using controllers to be throwing around um, grenades and stuff like that. Um, we've got internal solutions to using replica firearms and stuff so that it feels as true to life as possible. So that's super exciting. It's something that I'm majorly involved with at the moment. And then uh, at the moment, we're just getting ready to bring out our first game um, through the Freak Arcades. So that'll be our first one that gets put into uh, one of the venues and then rolls out into quarter three of this year. Um, but yeah, that should be released within, the, I'd say, the next three weeks or so. So that's very exciting. That's like well into development at the moment. Um, and yeah, that, they're the two main things that we've got at the moment. We've got um, other client work and stuff that we probably can't discuss, but there's just so much exciting stuff going on at the moment. It's crazy what technology is doing right now and everything's just accelerating. It's going faster and faster and the things we're able to do in terms of headsets and VR, like we're not um, tethered to computers, obviously, anymore. You've got your headsets like um, your Quest and the HTC Focus 3 and stuff where we're getting just as good imagery and graphics and everything on these headsets um, wirelessly now. So it just opens up mm. the, the conversation to having like 30 by 30 meter VR experiences and stuff. So it's all on the way. Um, and yeah, very exciting. Starting to progress pretty quickly in terms of what's capable and what you can do. And it's kind of like when I was talking about Unreal 5 before, like it's going to, it's going to get like really impressive pretty soon, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, like I was looking on Instagram of they showed they showed like a snapshot of the new Unreal Five and you're like that this looks almost like like really like so realistic you know it pretty much yeah. looks real yeah yeah, yeah. But, um, um, yeah. they're using uh so to go onto that they've done something that's sort of blown Unity out of the water in terms of um, graphics capabilities they've used a new system called Nanite um, it's like a rendering engine that oh, you can okay. have so many more um, let's say complex models and stuff within the scene that it actually can process and render out so much e more easily than it used to be able to. So it just allows for much more complex scenes, which looks so much more beautiful um, at a fraction of the cost as it would have been uh, before Nanite, this new system in Unreal Engine 5. So I'm extremely excited to have a look at it and get stuck into it, um, but yeah. Awesome. Um, like how has being exposed to sort of that wider area of game development sort of helped you with your career? You know? Um, yeah, I'd say you need to, um, with games, like between the things that we do, I see, I'd say a major thing, um, that it's helped me with it being exposed to games is my maths. Um, and I never really understood just how important it was until, um, start, started doing some stuff at AIT, which sort of made me get myself like right back into it, but like definitely getting out into the professional environment, um, and working on these games and that you realize just how important your mathematics is. And if yeah. anyone is looking to get into games, especially, um, and maybe it wasn't your strongest um, class in school or anything like that. Um, it's definitely worth getting stuck into and just starting to look at some simple things in that. And it becomes so fun um, once you start to understand some things and put it together and start to write that piece of code that makes that thing happen and work consistently. I mean, Unity is such a good feeling. Um, mm. But I'd say besides that, it gives you such a deep appreciation for everything that goes into a game. So there's obviously so much more that goes in outside of um, the code and programming and that, but you've got your, obviously your artists. And when I say an artist, there is such a diverse range um, of people that work within that department. So you obviously have your people that are modeling, but you have your people that are specifically making like your textures and your shaders and your materials and bringing that all together. You've got your audio, uh, people that are working with like your camera dollies and stuff, or just your camera angles in general and your camera systems. And I could go on and on, but it gives you such a deep appreciation for all of that. And I will say that one of the best things about AIT for myself was being exposed to all of that as opposed to, mm. I came in thinking I wanted to be a developer, but just being able to dip my toe into each of those realms and have an understanding helped me so much to come on. And if I had to do something simple with making a model or something like that, um, I could do that. And that was sort of a big thing for uh, my employer or our boss, sorry, at the time, the director, um, to see me doing those few things that other developers that come on that could only do development um it sort of made me sort of a jack of all trades to some extent um mm. but yeah so off the like off the back of that like what do you think's the most sort of like valuable thing to look for when you're deciding where to study like what do you what do you like what does the school have to have basically yeah um so for me looking at the time I knew, like I just said, I wanted to do development, but there was mm. a big, a big interest for me to just check out everything else as well, because I was obviously in that time before I started at AIT, I was looking at some art stuff and all of that as well. So it wasn't just only programming. So I definitely wanted to find a place that would at least let me try everything because maybe I could think I want to be a developer, but I actually really like modeling and 3ds Max and stuff like that. So mm. 
that was a big thing for me, but I'd say it's such an important thing um, for a lot of people that probably don't realize, but just having that knowledge coming in is such a major help. So um, that, that should be a big thing for everyone. I reckon if they're looking for a place that finding um, a uni or a private college or whatever that does allow you to get some sort of base understanding of all parts and not just the one thing that you want because yeah. having all of that you are as useful as you can be in your one area but being able to also understand and communicate with other teams about those other things with that base knowledge um, proves so helpful yeah I agree I agree um, thanks heaps for that Jack um, yeah. I'll bring Henry on who's been on the chat Henry how you going man good good thanks Jack for sharing so much with us especially the military project I'm surprised you could have even said anything about it <laughs> no no it's all, right. it's all out there we're um, ASX listed as well our company so everything that we do is all it's all public knowledge really oh, so okay. anyone can go find it fantastic awesome <laughs> Now, we did have a few questions coming through from the audience today. Uh, the first one was from Owen. Owen, uh, when did you first get employed? I actually think you mentioned it because it was right from the for internship, right? Yeah, so straight away from 2016, around the middle of the year was when I graduated. Um, it would have only been about, I'd say, two or three weeks in between while I was organizing the internship and then starting straight away about midway through 2016. Great, awesome. Now, I had one for and as well from Wafa. The, can you tell us and a little bit more about the support system that AIT provide? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that we have um, sort of available. So the, the first one and probably the most popular one in terms of support system is called the PAYS program. So it stands for Peer Assistance Improvement Scheme. So what we do is we assign third year students as mentors to first year students. So you're getting advice from someone who's done the course, you know? So like they, they can tell you how to tackle assignments because they've done it themselves, you know, in terms of things, how, um, you know, things you should focus on more than the other, but it's just nice to have a mentor. And it's kind of similar to what the teachers end up doing in the Forge program. They sort of become your mentors as opposed to your teachers. So that's the one thing we do. We can set up one-on-one -on -one tutoring with you as well with the teacher. So you can have one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher. Um, for more sort of counselling based stuff, you'll have access to what's called the Uprise app, which gives you a whole range of services like over the phone or video conferences with, with psychologists and stuff like that. So that's all through the app system or you can just like chat to them online. Um, and then there is the prospect of like assignment extensions and stuff if you have like, um, you know, like a valid reason basically. Um, but that's pretty much what we have set up. And then if there's anything outside of that, it's just a matter of sitting down and talking to student services and, and discussing what it is that you actually need. Because we don't just sort of say like, here it is, it's for you. It's, it is kind of personalized and it is kind of tailored to what you need specifically. So it sometimes is a hard question to, to answer because it's more, it's more like what it is that you need and how we can help that, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Awesome. I think that's that's pretty covers it. Also, obviously, with your study, we also offer equipment depending what course you are doing. So beside the other support, additional support, you will get lots of it uh, throughout the course from the educators and other student services. Hmm. Now, Phoebe was interested to know from Jack, uh, did you have any motivational issue while studying? At some point, did you hit kind of like a you know point when you're like, oh, uh, I'm getting sick of it. <laughs> um, I don't know about sick of it. I definitely had some time. I went, I went pretty hard um, in terms of like just wanting to get as much out of it. And also I was doing like crazy amount of like outside of school, um, uni time um, from AIT. I was doing a lot of time uh, at home just looking more things up to get more ready. I, I was like extremely passionate and like almost obsessed um, with it as well. Like I really opened the door and like, I was ready to learn it all. Um, you definitely have those times. I was juggling um, full-time hospitality work on the side as well. So I was doing about it's like anywhere between like 30 to 40 hours a week as well um, doing that. So it's just a juggle. So I guess if anything, maybe that did bring up that at some points where it was just, I was working myself too much in the spare time. Like if I was juggling just the hospitality stuff and uni, I would have been fine. But I think just me being my own worst enemy and doing all of that extra learning and stuff as well. So it, it, you get there sometimes, but it's natural burnout sort of thing. Um, and everyone does get there. I'd say it's the only way to explain if I ever hit a point sort of like that would just be general burnout that was self-inflicted. So that was probably the worst I got. <laughs> awesome. Do you think professionally over those years you've been already working in the industry, have you had that feeling sometimes as well? That was part of the question from Phoebe as well. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's no secret, really, that there has to be crunch at some points in what we do. Um, you'll find it anywhere you go, really. It's just depending. You're working with hard deadlines that they're not going to move for anybody. So there are times when you do need to do that, but you really need to find a, an employer in a workplace that sort of supports um, the aftermath of that if it does happen. So luckily with Red Cartel, um, if we ever have that, and we, you, you know it's going on as well and everyone knows it's going on. So we need to make sure that people can refresh themselves and their minds. If we know there's been a crazy amount of overtime going up and lead up to anything, then we need to do time in lieu and just let people sort of refresh and all of that. Because it, it does no one any good um, if you're just pushing someone up to a deadline and then it, here's the next deadline, let's get straight onto that as well. It, just your productivity is going to decrease. Morale across the entire team is going to go down. Um, it's just not good for anyone. So yeah, th- th- you absolutely will. There's burnout at some points. So you just need to find a place that helps you remediate that and just fix yourself up afterwards and supports that too. Awesome. There was a question from Andy and I think we already answered it regarding if you need any experience. I will a little bit modify this question because I'm interested to hear a little bit more from your perspective. If there are people today watching and thinking, I want to be like Jack, I want to be do, working in the industry, building games and stuff like that. And they obviously are missing the bachelor at this stage. What would you recommend as a kind of preparation for them? What do you think would be useful for them? Sure. Um, so I guess prior to me coming in, I'll just say flat out that you could, if you're passionate enough and everything, that you don't need any prior experience at all. Well, I didn't at all. I'm not sure where the classes are at right now, but if anything, I think they'd be more accessible and ready for people with, even lower levels of experience. And when I say that, I mean, I did a couple of tutorials on YouTube with Unity and stuff like that. Like I was by no means anywhere near comfortable in Unity or C Sharp or programming or anything of the sort. So I'd say the entry level is perfect for anybody of all skill levels. Um, You also, if you're coming in with some prior knowledge in that, you also have access obviously to your teachers and stuff who can start to answer your questions with maybe some of the more advanced stuff as well. So yeah, I'd say it's entry level is fine for anybody, especially if the passion's there, then it's going to be no issue at all. That's pretty good to know. Yeah, lots of students asking about this. So I feel it's always the best when people who gone through it can answer this one as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Jack. I think this is pretty much the last question I had here. Uh, is there any more questions, guys? Feel free to send it through. You can keep them coming as well because we're going to jump into games programming after this. And then we've got a um, Natalia who's going to talk as well. So you can keep the, the questions coming. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, Jack. And thanks heaps, Sorry, Henry. Uh, it's always always a pleasure to see you, man. <laughs> yeah, likewise, mate. Thank you for having me. Very much appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, so 